Um, for those of you that don't know, I am Rebecca Quinn. I am the program director for the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. Um, and we've been doing these webinar Wednesdays lately, and today we're doing one on cognition. So we thought that it was a good one to share and wanted to share with you guys. Um, so that you know, past webinar Wednesdays are on our website and they are recorded, so you can access those. And there will be, once this is recorded and loaded on, up online, there will be a link for you to request CEUs if you would like to request CEUs or go back and watch it again if you would like um, those pieces. Um, additionally, um, I will say, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, we do have, these are our upcoming uh, webinar Wednesdays that will be coming up. So we've been doing them every uh, two weeks on Wednesday afternoon. So June 17th, we'll be doing a follow-up to this uh, presentation. This is on cognitive skills. And then on June 17th, we're gonna do metacognition and awareness. It's kind of the highest level cognitive skill, but it we felt deserved its own time. So we are gonna do that on June 17th. And then on July 1st, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Schmo from uh, Minnesota is gonna speak on the automatic nervous system. And then on July 15th, we're going to have a session on brain injury in the criminal justice system. Uh, and that is actually gonna be a panel that is going to be an individual uh, with brain injury addiction and a criminal justice pass speak, and then an addiction counselor and a probation and parole officer. Uh, kind of doing a panel speaking about their experiences uh, with brain injury within the criminal justice system and how identifying and coming learning about brain injury has kind of affected their work. So that'll be coming up July 15th. So reviewing those for you guys. So thank you. And this flyer is also on our website uh, and hopefully you get emails from us with it. But if not, feel free to also go on our website and sign up for emails. So that is a lot of information there. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with cognitive skills and the impact on brain injury. Um, for this presentation, we are gonna go ahead and delve right in to uh, possible impairments uh, from brain injury. So hopefully you have all that background information on brain injury. Um, so one of the things when we talk about possible impairments with brain injury, um, you know, everything we do in, you know, can be impacted by a brain injury because our brain controls everything we do. So possible impairments can be a wide range. Um, usually we think about them as baskets. So these physical, cognitive, and emotional behavioral baskets. Um, and then we do have, uh, I always like to think about the, the red area that's um, of kind of some of the hallmarks of brain injury. Um, and those fall into fatigue, inconsistency, and lack of awareness. Um, and I always think of those of having kind of their own special category, simply because they are pretty pervasive across individuals that have brain injury. And they have an impact on everything else. So how fatigued somebody is will have an impact on any cognitive impairment they have. You know, if they have a memory impairment, it may be better when they're well rested versus when they're tired. Um, same thing with, you know, that inconsistency, somebody has a memory impairment, it may be better one day, but then the next day it may be, you know, worse, or it may be that they do really well with one type of memory, but then really poor with another. So that inconsistency can be common in brain injury. Um, and then the lack of awareness piece, that's the metacognition. Um, that's the one that we're going to talk an entire uh, time about in two weeks. So feel free to come back and join us when we talk about lack of awareness. Um, but then other than that, the major categories are these physical, you know, cognitive and emotional behavior. So today we're really going to focus on those cognitive changes and possible cognitive impairments and sort of go through cognition as a, the stair step levels of how uh, our different cognitive skills build on each other and how impairments in cognitive skills can affect somebody and then how to support them. So some of the challenges uh, to success um, are definitely, you know, even regarding cognition, are problems with regulation of thoughts, feelings, and behavior. 
um, anytime, you know, that regulation piece. So somebody may have, you know, difficulty in, in, you know, impact cognition or cognition skills, but then their difficulty with regulating their thoughts and feelings and behavior can affect their cognition as well. Um, difficulty of benefiting from experience and remembering information from one session to the next show or, you know, one time to the next. That's particularly true if you're working with an individual or as an individual, having that difficulty of benefiting and remembering. Um, one of the things that we don't realize how much our, you know, our society and how much when we interact with different people and things, there really is that reliance on new learning perpetually happening. Um, you know, when you, when you talk with somebody, you get information from them, you get their perspective, and you, you benefit and learn from that so that the next time you talk with that individual, your conversation with them is more in depth or you're able to provide more information because you know what they're looking for. So if somebody has difficulty with memory in those pieces, then they have difficulty benefiting from that. And it can be hard carrying information forward. Um, another challenge for success for individuals with brain injury can be a disconnection between intention and behavior. Um, this is one that is really difficult as far as, you know, for providers working with individuals with brain injury and really, really frustrating to the individuals with brain injury themselves. Um, to be able to have the best of intentions and really great ideas about where you would like your life to be going and goals you want to be doing in those pieces, but then not having the skill set to put those intentions into action and not being able to carry through can be very frustrating. And that's a common disconnection with a brain injury related to deficits and cognitive skills. So we'll kind of talk about that. Um, you know, individuals may not always fit well with others. Uh, brain injury definitely uh, can be something that's socially isolating, you know, problems with perceiving information, understanding others, um, behaving according to social norms, being able to, you know, do back and forth conversation, all of those type of things really affect interaction and friendships and social connections. So also having the understanding that for individuals with brain injury, there, there's not just all of these cognitive things that have an impact on their ability to maintain friendship, social connections connections. <sighs> Uh, one of the things anytime working with an individual with brain injury is really wanting to start out by identifying some of their communication and learning styles. Um, it's really easy just asking, you know, an individual how well they read and write um, or observing through samples, you know, is that something that they really rely on, you know, the written word and are comfortable with it or do they really struggle with it? Um, I have individuals that they will point blank tell me, no, uh, I have problems with reading and writing since my injury. I don't like, you know, having to write stuff down or those pieces. So really just asking individuals, um, really a good place to start of getting that, you know, information. Um, asking about and observing a person's attention span. Um, we'll talk about attention span um, as we, you know, go through the different cog cognitive skills. Um, attention span is definitely something that is very readily noticeable. Um, and you can see and be able to observe that attention. Um, and then being attuned to whether or not somebody's attention seems to change, if they're in a busy environment, or are they in a quiet environment, how that attention and those attention skill sets are affected by the environment around them. Um, ask about their ability to learn new ideas. You know, how, how is it for them to learn new information? If they're taught new skills, do they feel like they pick them up really quickly or do they feel that they really struggle with that? Um, and then, you know, just getting an idea of what they see as their strengths and weaknesses and all of that. <coughs> um, and then these are also questions, you know, again, asking what helps with. So just for somebody, you know, what helps with you finishing your work? What helps staying on track? Um, those pieces. Um, so always wanting to start out with that ask, you know, asking what helps or how, the, how their attention, where they're at. Um, one of the things I will clarify with these two slides um, is, and again, to kind of preview that, uh, in two weeks we will be talking about metacognition and lack of awareness. Um, I feel that these two slides do need to have that clarifier of kind of an asterisk in that 
individuals with brain injury often are not the best self-reporters of their skill sets. So you always want to be asking them, you know, how they do with things and what helps and that piece, but always trying to also find a, you know, a third point or an alternative that either backs that up or maybe shows that they might, that might not be as accurate as they think it is. So you, you know, often with individuals with brain injury can't do that reliance on where, you know, they're at. So again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about, you know, lack of awareness and metacognition, but just kind of keeping that in mind with those two slides. So the big thing that we're talking about today is what is cognition? Um, cognition is kind of a really complex process of all of our mental activities. Um, cognition is the process of us having sensory input that comes in through all of our senses. Um, and then we sort of manipulate that within our brain. So we, you know, reduce it, we elaborate it, we kind of determine what to be done with it and, and we use it. And so it's the use of that sensory input and how we use that within our brain. Um, so without our brain having cognition, you would really just have that sensory input coming in, but you wouldn't then have anything done with it. So from something as simple to if you touch a hot stove, that your brain having that ability to immediately pull your arm away and be like, oh, that was hot. Um, all the way up to, you know, being able to have like a sense of self in our community. That's all cognition and that's all created based on just that sen simple sensory input. And one of the things I'll say here is so cognition is all of these skills that build upon each other. Um, so we do have this like pie wheel here and we're going to start with attention and then we're going to work our way around the pie through executive function. Um, and then, like I said, in two weeks, we'll be doing the metacognition awareness. But because they really, those skill sets really build on top of each other and you need the previous skill in order to really benefit from the, you know, the next one. And so that they really are required to, to kind of form that, that functioning system together. So the first one we're going to talk about is attention. Um, attention is vitally important. It influences all other cognitive skills. Um, difficulties with attention can be uh, difficult across the board um, and cause problems with then all of the other skill sets that we'll talk about. Um, so oftentimes I'll hear from people, they'll say, well, they have problems with memory. And actually it seems like less that they have problems with memory and more they have problems with attention. Because if you're not attending to something, then you can't remember it. Um, so part of, you know, is really looking at where attention's at. Um, and the whole purpose of attention is we do not have unlimited processing resources. We don't have unlimited resources in our brain. Um, you know, if all of us had, you know, super genius IQs, then attention would be less important. But because a majority of us, there may be some of you out there, but not myself, <laughs> have just regular routine IQs, um, attention is important for me to be able to uh, spread my resources out and get the, get the most benefit from what resources I do have. So attention is kind of your brain's way of filtering and going, up. Oh, that's not important versus up, oh, this is important. So the first level of attention, and it, we do have that kind of stair step there of like levels of attention. Um, the first level is focused attention. So focused attention is the ability to focus on something for a short period of time. Um, so for somebody that is focused attention, you know, that ability to maybe look at a picture for, you know, a few minutes, being able to sustain, you know, that, that focus and look on something. Then the next step up is sustained attention. Um, sustained attention is the ability to focus on something for a more extended period of time. For somebody that has deficits in sustained attention, um, you may see that they more are like a, a butterfly and their eyes float around the room. 
and they may look at you, but then, you know, a minute later, they're looking out the window, and then a minute later, they're, you know, looking over here and over here, and, and they have that, that really hard time of focusing, and so you're kind of constantly going, okay, ba ba back to here, ba back, you know, back to this point, so that, that's difficulty in sustained attention, that they maybe can focus on something, but then they can't sustain it. Then after sustained attention, you move into selective attention. Um, selective attention is that ability to sustain <laughs> and ignore what else is going on. So for somebody that has difficulties in selective attention, that may be somebody that has a really hard time with the bouncing pen on the table next to them. You know, they can't focus on their test because the person next to them is bouncing the pen. Or difficulty with, you know, having a conversation while the TV is playing in the background. So, so that's that it's selective of being able to ignore unimportant information and just focus on what you think you should be focusing on. Then the next one is alternating attention. Um, a good example of alternating attention is any one of you that right now is paying attention to me while doing something else. Um, you know, you may be checking your email, um, you know, filing your nails, whatever you're doing, but you're also kind of paying attention to me. So we all sort of use that alternating attention um, and you're paying attention to it, but you go back and, you know, so you might be paying attention to me and then you go check your email for a couple minutes and then you come back. And so that's that alternating attention. And then the final one is divided attention. Divided attention is really kind of the most complex of our attention skills. Um, the best example I can give with divided attention is um, we all have no problem driving radio. Um, so we're divided, we're doing both of them. But then if we get lost, we automatically kind of turn down the radio. Or if we're talking to somebody else in the car, we tell them to quiet because we now need to focus more attention on our directions. And so we need to pull resources from that divided and move down to selective. So that divided attention is that ability to be giving attention resources to multiple things at the same time. Um, like I said, that is our highest level of attention. It's a very difficult one and it's one that all of us, even without a brain injury, uh, struggle with on a daily basis. Um, you know, it is really where having, you know, that difficulty with at the end of the day, cooking dinner and mixing, missing a step because your child came in and was trying to talk to you. Um, so all of that's divided attention. But so through these, um, it is important uh, to look at where somebody has difficulties with attention. Um, you know, if there is that individual that is having trouble with sustained attention, then that is definitely going to need to be supported differently than somebody that's having problems with the alternating attention. Uh, you know, for somebody that has difficulty with sustained attention, that may be that individual that it's hard to really get them to stay on focus. And instead, you need to have some cueing to keep them unfocused and then take frequent breaks. Whereas somebody that has, you know, problems with alternating attention, that might be something where you have to set alarms to remind them to go back to what they were paying attention to before when they kind of divide their attention in that way. So, so they would be supported differently. So, but all of that falls within that attention. <coughs> So one of the, some of the things to look for when looking for um, attention um, is again, that after a short period of being checked out, uh, that's, you know, as I talked about that individual, that their eyes kind of can't stay focused. Um, they seem not to pay attention to what is being said. Um, a lot of times individuals have difficulty with attention can be thrill, thrill seeking or excessive risk taking um, because they tend to be bored. Um, you know, they, they need that um, thrill to maintain attention. So they really want activities that kind of are uh, really engaging and thrilling because those are what keep them attending. Um, they seek sensory stimulation. Um, video games is the example here. Um, I have a lot of individuals that have uh, brain injury 
that have difficulty with um, the, the sustained and alternating attention, but that they become really obsessed with video games. Um, so any screen almost becomes like a black hole of attention for them. And because, you know, screen time, particularly video games or any type of, you know, those little game apps and things going on, those are really, really uh, high stimulation. They have a lot of visual stuff going on. A lot of times they also have sounds. They have all of that going on. And they are designed to require the most amount of attention from somebody to prevent somebody from being able to like from other things to be distracting so they're designed to be kind of this ultimate distraction to get people in a bubble so that people keep playing them and are not distracted and stop playing them but as a result for individuals with brain injury that have difficulties with regulating that and difficulties with you know alternating attention those pieces they you know become even more so you know uh, attached to them and kind of stuck with them so a lot of times with individuals with brain injury having even set up you know screen time and alarms and things like that to kind of limit some of the video game use um, often appear bored or disinterested um, again, for problems with attention that really need to keeping things engaged. Uh, so difficulty with doing things like, um, you know, following conversation. So might be bored with conversation, um, difficulty watching a movie, um, you know, movies requires sustained attention. So they might say things like, I don't like watching movies. I get bored, um, you know, anything like reading a book requires attention. So, so that, that bored or disinterested because they need something that kind of is continually keeping their brain attending. <coughs> so accommodating problems with attention, um, particularly in working with an individual, um, always wanting to have an attention grabber to start you know, really checking for good eye contact, making sure that there is that initial attention before beginning a task or activity, really wanting that, that start point. Um, breaking things down, so really wanting to keep instructions brief, simple, to the point, um, you know, few, as few steps as possible and keeping it simple. Um, really presenting information organized one point at a time so you're not going to be wanting to give individuals three or four steps at a time that they're having to pay attention to and then reflect back on. So really wanting to give them that one point at a time. Um, providing hands-on information. So as much as you can have individuals having hands-on practice or rehearsal while you're giving them information, as much as they could do something hands-on, uh, the better. Um, because any type of movement and tactile activities, doing things with their hands, really enhances the energy and enhances their focus and attention on it. So really that, that being able to have the two different mechanisms of doing it is helpful. <coughs> so um, ne the next skill set after attention is categorization. Um, Categorization is our brain's um, grouping and processing, uh, the process of grouping and classifying things. Um, so categorization is a really important skill. Um, it's a skill that usually develops developmentally um, right around three. Um, you know, you can tell a child that has mastered categorization is when they start to understand that you know small furry things are animals but not everything that's furry is a cat so they start to get that difference um you know so you might see a toddler that points at everything with wheels that moves on the road is a truck and then by the time they're a little bit older then they understand nope that one's a truck and that one's a car so that's really our categorization process. It's kind of like our filing cabinets in our brain. This is really, really important. <laughs> um, the ability to categorize and our categorization skills is really kind of overlooked as a skill set. Um, but we are constantly, constantly bombarded with incoming stimuli, um, continually. 
And the ability to categorize information allows us to process that more efficiently and quickly. So it allows us to quickly know, yes, this is something I've seen before, and then I know how to handle it and manage it. So it allows for that. And then to not have categorization causes to have slower thing processes and affects things like organization, because in order to you know, have those organization skills, you need to kind of be able to categorize. Um, it also affects things like the ability to, um, to carry skill sets from one area to another. So if you have deficits in categorization, you might really learn something. So you might learn an on the job skill like grocery bagging at the grocery store, but then those organization skills where your supervisor taught you to put the heaviest stuff on the bottom and really taught you not to put cold things with this, you can't carry forward those skills to packing for a beach vacation. And so, whereas you would think that the categorization skills, you would be able to say, okay, my boss taught me to put the heavy stuff on the bottom when I'm grocery bagging. So I'm gonna over here with my beach suitcase, I'm also gonna put the heavy stuff on the bottom. Or, you know, I was taught not to put frozen things with this, so I'm gonna do it. So, so if, you, if you lack categorization skills, it really prevents that ability to carry skills from one environment to another. <coughs> Again, these are really important for um, speed of processing, problem solving, other higher environments. Um, this is an example on the screen of, you know, all of these are cats, um, but very quickly, only one of these would I have a strong reaction to if I saw out in the wild. Um, if I was walking down the street and I saw the first three, I would be, okay, no problem. But if I were to see the fourth one walking down the street, that would immediately trigger my, you know, fight or flight mechanism. And I should say my flight mechanism, not my fight, but my flight mechanism is like, what's going on? Um, and so that would be an immediate, just related to my categorization skills, because I know in, uh, that all of these are cats, but I know that one is a specific type of wild cat that I should not be expecting on the street in North Dakota. So, but that's that immediate brain reaction of being able to pull that information and have it categorized. Um, again, a real life categorization problem is often like going to the grocery store. Um, you know, some of the difficulties with <coughs> when you go to the grocery store knowing that you have a list and being able to um you know group like things together so if you were to go shopping and had this as your grocery list there are ways that you could organize it that would make more sense and so the question is you know how would you organize this list um, because if you were to start with bread and then go to ice cream and then go back to bananas, you know, you might be bouncing all over the place. Um, whereas instead, organizing it as, you know, through this way. <coughs> and so this is a way of organizing it where you have your bread and bagels together because they are both, you know, going to be in the bread items section. And then you have your frozen items together and your fruit together. Um, for individuals that have problems with categorization, this can be kind of an unsurmountable task and something that is overwhelming. And instead they do end up doing it, the list this way, and they're bouncing all over the place and maybe they get about halfway through the list and then they get exhausted and they can't do anymore and they're done and they end up going home with only half their list and they kind of don't know why. Um, so really that's a real life categorization problem of something just like grocery shopping being sort of an unsurmountable um, task. And you know, the simple answer is, well, you know, make a list, but the individual did make a list. But then maybe the next step is, okay, you made a list, but we need to work more on you categorizing your list. 
or for like for somebody, if somebody had problems with this, um, it may be that they would do better with having a checkoff list where the items are already grouped together based on their category, you know, in the store so that they just check them off and the categorization is already in place for them. So those are ways of kind of thinking about how, how is this as a barrier and okay ways that could maybe come around it. Okay, hang on just a second. So our next skill set is memory. Um, memory is very complex. Um, it is something that we get uh, asked about all the time. Um, there are, you know, four inch thick uh, textbooks on memory. Um, so memory is definitely something that we uh, is complex and we only know so much about. Um, and I would say we still don't have as, you know, scientists and everything still don't have a complete understanding of really how memory works. Um, one of the things is with memory is, so memory is all of the information comes in and we've utilized our attention skills and our categorization skills to help with the memory. And now we kind of encode the information and then we're going to store it and then have that retrieval ability. So for most individuals with brain injury, the difficulty is really in kind of the, the encoding and the storage, not so much in retrieval. Um, you know, because of amnesia and soap operas, um, I think uh, long-term memory loss gets a whole lot of like recognition and people think a lot about that. Um, but for most individuals with brain injury, they have no problem um, having, remembering their old memories, like no problem with that old memory retrieval. But instead where the problem is, is really more in the encoding and the storage portion and that then being able to retrieve new information that's encoded in storage. So really more problems with like making new memories and more short-term day-to-day memory than long-term memory. So in looking for uh, assessment of memory and memory deficits, um, looking for inconsistence in performance of task, um, you know, if an individual has problems with some areas but not others, it may be related to difficulties remembering the different uh, steps to one task. Uh, it may be that one task is something that they had done before their injury and they have absolutely no problem remembering how to do that task. And then another is something they've learned since their injury. And so they've had problems like learning the new routine. Um, really that difficulty recalling previous information. So if they, if somebody has difficulty, you know, recalling something that, you know, a skill set that you maybe had talked about last week. So it might be that if somebody's on the job and their boss shows them the new routine for clocking in and then the next week they come in and they have forgotten how to clock in again. So it's that, you know, recalling that previous information. Um, again, difficulty learning new information. Um, for an individual with problems with memory, they may appear inattentive. So it may be that because they don't remember, you think that they have, they weren't paying attention, but instead they were paying attention. It's just they're having problems with memory. Uh, does not follow through with activities or instructions. Um, a lot of times, you know, an individual, if they're having deficit in their memory, uh, they may have problems that follow through because they may not remember what was, what instructions were given to them, or they may not remember all the steps. So then they don't follow through. Um, often individuals that have problems with memory, they will describe themselves um, as, you know, I have problems with memory or others will say they're forgetful. So they have, you know, that kind of awareness sometimes. So they may describe it themselves. <laughs> um, accommodating problems with memory. There are a huge number of ways to accommodate uh, problems with memory. 
Um, the first being provide as many means as possible to remember information. Um, you know, the more ways that you do it, the better. Um, so prevent, presenting information in several ways. So if you're giving somebody directions, you may want to provide them a written list of the directions you're giving them. Tell them verbally and show them. So that's, you know, you're providing them three different ways of getting the information. Um, always, you know, if possible, provide a written summary of important information. Um, so like if you're meeting with somebody and it's a client and they maybe have an appointment, writing down that next appointment for them and writing down any action items, you know, providing that written summary for them. Uh, if it is somebody that uses some form of organizational system, you know, sometimes it's helpful to cue them to use it. A lot of times individuals may have adopted some type of organizational system, but then they forget. Um, and so cueing them, you know, you have an appointment with your doctor next week. How about, you know, you write it down in your, you know, calendar right now. So kind of cueing somebody. Um, repeat, 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 repeat. Um, one of the biggest things with memory is repetition. Um, you know, the more you can repeat things, the better. Uh, for even individuals with very significant memory impairments can have, you know, can work on and have areas that they do remember uh, with repetition. So many times it may be that, you know, having a month of the same thing repeated, but then eventually they kind of are like, oh yeah, that. So repeating information, um, you know, being able to understand that providing somebody directions may take longer than if they didn't have a brain injury. So if somebody, you know, when I described that individual earlier, who there was that new process for clocking in at work, they might've been told it one time when they come into work a week later, they may have completely forgotten that. But that doesn't mean that, you know, doing it a second time through with them and then maybe even a third and a fourth, they will get there to where they will remember. It's just being able to have that time of review with them. Um, you know, reviewing that information frequently, asking them to repeat back, um, you know, really having those multiple ways of doing things. Um, summarizing and synthesizing the information can reinforce. Um, so all of those different ways of kind of repeating information. Um, one of the things here is, is that with a brain injury, often it's individuals who they're dealing with new, new deficits. So they probably always were able to rely on their memory before their injury. So they didn't have to think about how to remember things. It just happened the way it does for most of us. And so they're having to deal with a new, you know, deficit and really learning how to remember. And so often it is important to teach an individual and say, you know, Remember, we're working on, you know, you're working on the skill set of remembering your doctor's appointments better. And so you want to be writing them down in your calendar. So really important to kind of teach those skills of like, what are ways of remembering information? Um, and part of that is modeling and cueing compensation strategies. Um, really, the more that we can normalize um, compensation strategies, the better. Um, you know, for a lot of individuals, it's important for them to see that all of us have different ways and compensation strategies that we use for memory. Um, you know, I utilize my phone calendar. Um, without my phone calendar, I don't think I'd show up to anywhere. So it's important to have that as a, it's a normal strategy. And so a lot of times if, you know, I'm meeting with somebody or making an appointment, I'll model and cue that and say, I'm going to put this in my phone calendar because I forget things. So, you know, do you have a way that you keep up with things? Um, you know, writing a name down as soon as you meet someone, those pieces. 
Um, I will say as I've gotten older, I've had to do a better job of like not assuming that I'm going to remember something the next day because I can't rely on that anymore. Uh, so that's been a change. Um, so again, reinforcing um, and encouraging that because eventually wanting those compensation strategies to become automatic, but it takes time for some strategies to become automatic. That takes skill set of thinking about it that way and, oh yeah, I need to write this down. <clears throat> so the next skill is processing. Um, processing is basically the gears in our brain working. Um, it is the time that it takes for a person to gather the information, process it, and to respond. So for everything that comes in, we process. We process, is this something I need to remember? Is this something I need to respond to? Is this a way, you know, information that is just an FYI and I can sort of forget about, or is this really important information? So that's all related to processing. <laughs> um, as far as assessment for processing and what to look for, um, for individuals that have difficulty with processing, um, it may be that they only pick up like a portion of instructions given or a portion of conversation. Um, particularly for like slowed processing speed, if somebody has slower time processing, so their gears move slower, then if you're giving them a three step directions, while you're talking about step two, they're still processing step one. And then they finish processing step one and they're back and ready engaged to listen, but you're already on to step three. And so when that person then recalls that information in order to carry out the activity or the instructions, they only have you know, step one and step three. They don't have step two. And then, so they do it based on step one and three, thinking they had all the steps because they didn't hear step two and know that you were at a different place. So, so that really only picking up portions um, has difficulty keeping up with conversation um, for somebody that has, you know, problems with following conversation, particularly from multiple people, um, the same with, you know, watching TV, those pieces um, may tire out easy, may appear zoned out, um, often can appear lazy, um, unmotivated, um, kind of passive. Um, for some of these individuals, it may be seen as, you know, they... <coughs> they don't you know want to be engaged so they're unmotivated but really it's more just it takes them longer to respond um for accommodating um accommodating problems with processing uh you really want to be doing a frequent check-in for understanding so getting an under you know that check-in you know okay, we're going over, you know, the directions for you to mop the floor. And I told you step one, are you ready for me to talk about step two? Um, you know, you can do pre-process and post-process recaps. I find that the pre-process and post-process recaps are something I really recommend a lot, um, particularly for any individual that's in like any type of group counseling, any group activities to really have a one-on-one -on -one pre uh, process where you say, okay, today at group, we're gonna talk about feelings of grief. And what are some feelings of grief you, you know, maybe have that you think you could share with the group? And, you know, so doing that as a pre and then post doing a really quick, you know, today at group, you know, everybody talked about our feelings of grief did you know that, you know, did you have anything to add that you thought anybody, you know, talked about that was important? Or Sally added how difficult it's been with her coming to terms with her brain injury. Is that something you've experienced? So really that pre and that post to help their brain kind of put the pieces together. Um, keeping it simple, uh, simplifying any information, providing, you know, one idea or one task at a time. 
simplistic sentences. So if you are giving somebody written instructions or written, not, you know, not utilizing semicolons or connector words, but nope, instead writing, you know, like a third grader, where we're really those short, simple sentences. Um, you know, breaking instructions into manageable pieces. Um, really, four is a perfect number. So you really don't want instructions to be beyond that of, you know, multi, multi steps because it really just becomes, you know, unmanageable as far as processing that information. Um, slow it down, um, allow for delay in response. Um, this is something that, as you can tell, I'm a pretty fast person. Um, and so when I have worked with individuals that have slowed processing, I can think of one individual particularly, it was really, really difficult um, for him and I together. And we actually had a great conversation about it where I said, look, I'm sorry, I know that this is an area with you, but I have a really fast processing. So the two of us together. And so we kind of approached it as a partnership. And I said, okay, I'm gonna need your help slowing things down. And, you know, you, you know, so you let me know and I'm gonna kind of help, you know, pull you along of getting, you know, responses. And so we did it, you know, we kind of made a joke out of it. Um, but often, like, like counting silently to yourself after asking a question. Um, you know, silence is one of those things that often we have difficulty with and we will try to fill the silence. Um, but you really need to, if you ask a question, allow extra time for the person um, because don't assume that just because it's taking them longer to answer means they don't want to answer or they don't have an answer. It just is taking that extra time. So wanting to allow that so that you're not, you know, talking over them or kind of filling in things, but allowing them to have those time. <coughs> so the next thing that we're going to talk about is executive function. Um, executive functions have really always been kind of conceptualized and thought of as our cognitive directors, like the coach of our brain. Um, they really are the ones that assist in the interaction between all of these other cognitive processes. The executive functions are more considered like our higher level processes that utilize memory and tension and processing to do higher level thinking and higher level processes. So really the executive function is kind of the, those higher skills. Um, these are really the skills that we develop and, you know, start developing around middle school and then really slowly develop. And then by young adulthood, you really want to have your executive functions in place. So a really good way to think about executive functions is they are those skills that we develop as a teenager. Um, and so having impairments in executive function is really that not having the, you know, those skill sets and having skill sets more along the line of somebody that is maybe at like a 13, 14 year old stage versus, you know, more adult. And so some of those executive functioning skills are hard to conceptualize. But if you think about those type of skill sets, those, that's a good way to kind of think about it. Um, so here are some of those. Um, <clears throat> that we kind of think about um, executive functioning. So initiation. So initiation is the ability to get started, um, initiate an action. Uh, <laughs> impulsivity. Um, so impulsivity is stopping action. Um, sometimes thought of as self-control. Um, planning and organization. Um, is in a really important executive function. Um, and then mental flexibility, the ability to adjust to changing situations and unfamiliar circumstances. So in looking at assessment of initiation, um, so somebody that has difficulty with initiation might have trouble starting with the task. Um, they may have difficulty really they understand, you know, they say that they want to do something. They really seem very motivated. They, you know, have goals that they want to do all of that, but then it just doesn't happen. Um, and that is that difficulty with starting that task. 
Um, they can appear passive or unmotivated. Uh, they need constant reminders or prompting to complete a task. Um, <clears throat> they're able to identify a goal, but not able to like see the steps or initiate the steps to get there. Um, often are referred to as kind of lazy. Um, you know, they're lazy, they don't want to get things done, those pieces. Um, accommodating problems with initiation. Uh, the first would be simplifying everything. The more that you can simplify things and break them down into small, more achievable steps, the better it is for initiation. Um, it can be easier to initiate a task if it seems like a very manageable right in front of you task. But if it's a task that's, you know, cleaning the kitchen, that can seem like an insurmountable task. But if the task is just unloading the top rack of the dishwasher, that can be something that is much more achievable. And so the more that you can break things into that achievable steps and focusing one step at a time, the better because that initiation can get kind of hung up and the idea that a task is unachievable. Um, using checklists and calendars, uh, timelet, you know, uh, anytime that you can use kind of a checklist or a calendar or a timeline to help keep things organized, um, prompt activities. Um, this also can really help some with like the initiation motivation of the idea of being able to see like completed activities. Um, also can then refer to the checklist when stuck. Um, also, the hope is that then over time that checklist may become internalized and allow for an individual to become familiar with the routine. It become part of their daily routine. So the checklist can be important to that. Um, setting alarms. Um, timers or alarms can be used to get started, um, to learn to focus on being productive, uh, set them for a period of time. You also can do rather than like a period of time alarm, you could do like an activity. So, you know, if we're back to the whole cleaning the kitchen thing, it might be, you know, you can spend, you know, 10 minutes petting the cat, but then after that, it's going to be time to unload the dishwasher. So, so kind of doing some setting goals and standards of what's going to be a, a starting a sign of it's time to start the activity. So next executive function that we're going to talk about is impulsivity. Um, so impulsivity is, uh, you know, like we said, it's that inability to, to stop yourself. Uh, kind of the reins of, of ourselves. Um, so for an individual has deficits and impulsivity, um, they may do or say things without thinking. Um, they may have trouble knowing when to stop an activity. Um, they may appear to do things quickly without regard for safety. Um, so they don't really have that, you know, ability to like rein themselves in and say, hey, wait a minute, is this the most, the safe way of doing it? Uh, they may not follow directions uh, because following directions means that we have that, you know, self-control to hold back long enough to read the directions. So for somebody that has problems with impulsivity, these are the people that throw out the directions and are like, oh, I don't need those. Um, and, you know, get halfway through the IKEA piece that they're putting together with, you know, missing pieces. <laughs> um, and they may dominate the conversation or interrupt because they don't have, again, those reins to rein in and recognize that it's not their time to talk and allowing somebody else to talk. Um, so they, they're, they're that impulsive of just dominating, you know, not interrupt, you know, just interrupting, moving forward. <coughs> those pieces with impulsivity. Um, another thing, you know, for me, I always used to, when I used to work with juveniles, I remember all the time I would say to kids, you know, like, why did you do that? And they would always answer the answer that I hated the most. And back then used to hate, hate was the, I don't know. Um, I, you know, would ask a kid why they did something and they go, I don't know. And I hated that. I'd be like, how can you not know you did it? But now I recognize that there definitely is a deficit in impulsivity. 
because in order to be able to answer the question, why did you do that? You had to have had the self-control and control of your impulses in order to stop long enough to think about it and make a decision to do something. But if you have deficits in impulsivity and you're just doing things quickly without regard and without thinking about it, and then somebody comes along and says, why did you do that? You don't have an answer for why you did it because you just did it because you were being impulsive. Um, so looking back on it, I can think that there are a lot of kids that I, you know, really struggled with that I don't know answer that probably had deficits in impulsivity. <clears throat> so accommodating problems with impulsivity. Um, the first is really teaching stop, think and act. Um, you know, and, and well, and I will say one of the first ways of accommodating it is even recognizing that there is a problem with impulsivity there. Um, you know, a lot of times we really skip over that uh, impulse control and assume that people have intact impulse control and then are setting up either behavioral plans or interventions based on that intact impulse control. And we're not really paying attention to whether or not they can follow through on what's being asked and they have that impulse control to do that. So, but then after that is really stop, you know, teaching that stop, think and act. So encouraging somebody to slow down and think about the consequences of behavior. Um, you know, and some of this might even be putting in place some external uh, ways of stopping. Um, so putting in place a, you know, mechanism to where they have to call and ask uh, before, they can, you know, make a decision. So saying, you know, before you, you know, sign up for, you know, to take a class, you need to, you know, call and review that with, you know, your case manager. So putting in place, you know, some different things. Um, it may be like going to the grocery store, you know, saying, okay, before you go to the grocery store, why don't you know you make sure to double check your list to see if there's anything that you're forgetting so putting in place some of those external mechanisms to really teach stop think and act um, working with immediate gratification um, one of the things with impulsivity is we really require a lot of long-term goals for individuals um, individuals really have a lot that they have to kind of focus on that long term. And so sometimes it really is providing incentives for shorter term goals um, that may help improve compliance, may allow somebody to stay on track with their longer term goal um, and a way of keeping that longer term goal in mind. So for a longer term goal that somebody has, they may not be able to see all the little different steps that will get there. And so helping them see that and then providing some rewards in the mechanism. Um, giving feedback, uh, particularly with impulsivity, uh, you want to be responding directly to any inappropriate behavior. Um, you know, you really right away need to be saying, you know, what you just said was not okay or, you know, that comment you made made me feel uncomfortable. So please don't make comments like that in the future. Um, so you need to be really clear about setting expectations, about limits, about consequences, really having that feedback right away um, so that there's a direct connection between what feedback you're asking and the action they've done so that they can start to learn that um, connection between the two rather than that weighted out idea. So the next piece is planning an organization. Uh, for individuals that have deficits in planning organization. Oh, I have a friend that has joined us that is making things not as easy. Oh, where were we? There we were. <laughs> um, so wanting to look for an individual that is late for appointments, um, has difficulty in remembering things that need to be done in the future. Uh, often misses important deadlines, um, gives up easily on a task, uh, appears to jump from activity to activity, has problems taking on uh, larger activities, 
So maybe things like cleaning the kitchen seems like too, too complex of an activity for them because they, they lack the planning and organizational skills to break it down and say, okay, the first step should really be, you know, gathering all the dirty dishes. Then the second step should be, you know, emptying the dishwasher. Then the third step would be loading the dishwasher. So they don't have those planning and organizational skills. And instead they're kind of doing a little bits at a time. So they're over here and then they're over here and then they're over here. And so they might unload half of the dishwasher, but then they go and start collecting dirty dishes, but then actually they, you know, get distracted in the living room by something and then they never get back to the kitchen. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of that jumping from activity to activity. Um, so accommodating problems with planning and organization. Um, the first is be predictable and encourage predictability. Um, the more that individuals can develop and maintain consistent routines, the better. Uh, consistency is, is really um, the individual with brain injury's friend. Uh, the more that things can be consistent and routine, follow a routine, the better. Um, for individuals, uh, the providers that work with individuals with brain injury, I really encourage them to, as much as you can, identify regular routines uh, for meetings. So if you're a case manager or a, you know, VR counselor or, you know, whatever, working with somebody, setting it up to where our appointments are always on Tuesdays at three that that really sets it as a you know, regular routine that makes it easier for that individual planning and organizing around. Um, encouraging the use of a planner um, and a system for organizing activities and appointments and to-do lists that really matches that individual. You know, what's gonna work for them as far as writing that down and utilizing something to help them organize things. Um, set the agenda, particularly for if you're working with an individual, um, reminding the, somebody that what, you know, your purpose of meeting with them is about, um, reminding them what a final outcome or a goal are. Um, if you're providing somebody with directions or instructions, uh, provide that information several times, um, asking an individual to repeat those back to me. Um, you know, asking, now you tell me the instructions in your own words. Um, you might, as far as for planning an organization, you may work, you know, I use the example of like cleaning the kitchen. It may be that you kind of work with them on, you know, helping fill in next steps. You know, what do you see would be a next step? And then if they can't come up with it, then you providing that for them. Or maybe a next step would be for us to unload the dishwasher. Uh, mental flexibility. Um, mental flexibility is the ability that we have to kind of think on our feet, uh, to be flexible, um, and to deal with kind of whatever life throws our way. And some people are much more flexible than others. Um, I think that the world over the last three months has really taught us a lot about being flexible as we've all had changes and shifts and had to really handle those. Um, so individuals that have problems with mental flexibility are people that may have difficulty understanding, you know, changes in things. Um, you know, they have difficulty thinking um, on his or her feet. Uh, you know, if they were gonna go to the grocery store and the grocery store closed early that day, they then, you know, can't process, oh, that's okay, I could go to the other grocery store, you know, three streets over. Nope, to them, they go home, there's not a grocery store. Um, often individuals with problems with mental flexibility, they get stuck on one idea or one way of thinking. Um, really, you know, their way of viewing it, they really can't see multiple perspectives. Um, they have difficulty adjusting to new or unexpected tasks or activities. Um, you know, being able to see that it's okay that, you know, we maybe are now doing support group via Zoom versus in person. Um, that difficulty with those new or unexpected. Um, they may be argumentative, not able to see other perspectives, not able to consider different ideas, 
That's all related to that mental flexibility. So for accommodating problems with mental flexibility, um, the first is rehearse. Um, again, don't take for granted that something learned in one environment will be generalized to another. So if you have, you know, somebody does have skill sets and you think they're going to be able to use them in a new environment, but wanting to rehearse and, you know, do them in that new environment, just to do that double check. Um, you know, when learning new strategies, important to practice them in multiple environments. Um, if somebody is working with like staff or support people uh, with multiple different staff or support individuals, um, you know, if somebody is learning to ride the bus, you're wanting to make sure that it's on multiple different routes and they're learning how to utilize the different routes. Um, again, if somebody is learning to use the grocery store by themselves, doing different grocery stores. So they become comfortable with the idea that shopping at the grocery store is a skill that, you know, you can transfer from one grocery store to another. Um, you know, I have, we, I have my grocery store that I like going to, and sometimes it's harder for me going to the other one because I'm like, it's laid out differently. So, but that, that requires that mental flexibility. So working on those skills of learning, oh, it's okay. They just have the dairy on this wall versus the back wall. And those, you know, being able to, to, to work on that mental flexibility. Uh, plan B, um, often individuals with cognitive problems because of everything we've talked about up to this point, um, really have problems coming up with solutions or alternatives. Um, so really wanting to work out plan B's and C's before there's a situation that develops. Um, so that that's already, that individual already knows that and they're comfortable with the new situation, um, prior to it happening so that they're not on the spot having to use cognitive reserves to come up with something. Um, this is particularly for true for anything that's, you know, uh, requires like travel or things like that. So like if somebody were to be traveling to visit family members or, you know, going to the grocery store, you maybe might have a conversation about, well, if our grocery store happens to be closed, what would be plan B? Could you think up some plan Bs of what we could maybe do? Um, so, so that piece. Um, often, you know, also practicing going and asking for assistance um, that's something that, you know, somebody may have difficulty with practicing and asking for help. Um, you know, if, if somebody is new to a job or something, they may need to know, okay, who would be somebody you could go and ask for help if you need to. Um, and then the other piece with mental flexibility and accommodating that is moving on. Um, so really working on teaching the idea of moving on and so review um, material and then say, you know, in five minutes, we're going to move on to a new subject or, you know, I'm going to review the information I gave you today and then now the next we're going to talk about what we're going to do next week. So giving kind of that information as far as that, that preview. Um, and sometimes it might even say, you know, we're finished with completing this material. Next, we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do next week. Would you like to take a two minute bathroom break in the middle? So providing some of that transition. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to even have like an agenda for people or a handout if you're going to be doing a transition while meeting with them or different activities throughout the day so that they can see that in writing. <laughs> but particularly for individuals with problems of mental flexibility, anytime you do that, put anything down in writing as far as like an agenda or a handout or any of that, you're going to want to put in there that there are the plan B. So if something were to happen, you know, then, you know, if the activity is that you are going to go swimming in the afternoon, but it's a thunderstorm and the pool is closed, what was the plan B? So, you know, having that so that individuals can really start to see that flexibility happening there, those pieces. 
So those, that's kind of our end of our cognitive processing. Um, as I said earlier, so in two weeks, we're going to talk about metacognition and awareness, which is the last, the kind of highest order cognitive function. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. Um, so now, um, having an understanding of formal assessments, um, as we've moved through all of these cognitive processes, one of the things that often comes up regarding cognition is <coughs> having formal assessments. Um, a lot of times, you know, a neuropsychological evaluation, um, neuropsychological exam or evaluation is really, uh, excellent opportunity to really look at all these cognitive skills and do formal assessment to gather those cognitive skills. Um, an evaluation can be incredibly helpful, provide a lot of information related to cognitive limitations, strengths, uh, weaknesses, um, provide option related to return to work options, return to school, um, just a lot of information for an individual as far as daily life. However, there are some barriers to formal assessments. Um, first of all, we live in North Dakota. Um, I think I can count on two hands our number of neuropsychologists in the entire state. Um, and 90% of those are located in the Fargo uh, area. <laughs> um, so I think there are like three not in the Fargo area. So, um, so it does make it difficult. It sometimes it's not always feasible. Um, and, you know, some of the things related to formal assessments, I often, you know, individuals will often ask about getting one or providers get one. I often do warn people that to really get an idea of what you're wanting to test for. Um, the scores are related as compared to established norms. Um, so they really are, will give you scores like processing speed in related to established, you know, norms of processing speed. But that may mean little as far as transferred to real life functionality. So there's some people that may have slower processing speed, but they've dealt with it their entire life. They've learned to accommodate it and they actually function very well. Whereas somebody might have a higher processing speed, but it may be very new to them from an injury that only occurred two years ago. They still haven't learned to accommodate it and they're still really struggling functionality wise. So they don't always mean, you know, uh, it, it doesn't always give you that functional information. Um, again, tests are also given in monitored environments. Um, usually they're given within a neuropsychologist office. Um, it's usually the testing is, you know, done as far as either pen and paper or computerized testing or answering questions to um, an assistant or a tech. Um, that's often very monitored. Usually it's only the individual and one other person um, in a controlled setting. And it only represents a snapshot in time. So it really sometimes doesn't give the full richness of really what that individual's real life functionality is like. Um, so one of the things though, is that I always say if an individual is going to be getting a neuropsychological evaluation or you're working with a client that you're recommending them get one, some of the best ways to get uh, beneficial information um, is to one, uh, determine and clearly communicate why the testing is being done and how the results will be used. Um, I, you know, usually say don't get testing just to get testing. Um, a lot of times people have always had it ingrained in them that with a brain injury, you need to get neuropsychological testing. So, but I really, you know, want, if you're going to be investing the, the funds into it, the travel, the, all of that, then really have a clear understanding of why it's being done, what you want the results for, in order to be able to relay that on to the neuropsychologist. Um, part of that next is providing as much information as possible prior to the evaluation as you can to that neuropsychologist. So if there is any information regarding um, the, you know, the injury, um, rehabilitation, anything related to, you know, work environment, work history, any of that type of information that can be provided prior to the testing will provide the more rich evaluation. 
Um, and then a best practice really is to see as much as you can have the individual's typical environment, match it as much as possible. Um, and as much as they can utilize some situational assessments, the better. Um, one of the things that I see about this and having the testing match the typical environment is a lot of times I will hear from individuals, um, neuropsychological testing can be anywhere from, you know, two to three hours worth of testing all the way up to about eight hours of testing. And, you know, I've heard from individuals that say, well, but I get fatigued and that's a really long amount of time to do it in. So, you know, could they break it up and me do it over four sessions? Well, yes, they can break it up and you could ask that, but part of that then is thinking about how do you want the testing to match your real life? In your real life, are you able to, you know, break up things like work to where you're only working two hours at a time? Or are you more having to work for longer stretches? Then really wanting in order to have that testing to most match your skill set wanting to have things like that fatigue from a longer period of time and those type of things show in that testing because if not that testing is not going to be a match to the real world environment very few of us um only function in the world uh well rested for two hours at a time so what having testing that only shows what you look like well rested for two hours at a time may not be the most like comprehensive and provide the best information as far as determining like future goals um, and abilities as saying, no, let's do the testing more in a larger group. So sometimes it's really important to think about that as far as what information we want, how are we gonna utilize it as to how should the testing be set up. And those are conversations that if you are gonna be having neuropsychological testing, you can um, have, you know, and have that conversation with that individual. So other assessments, um, I will say, so for here in North Dakota, there is um, a symptom inventory that uh, we are working on adopting, um, which is a five page self report um, with matching handouts for individuals. And we're working with Colorado to be able to adopt that here in North Dakota to where if providers are working with somebody with brain injury, they can um, have that individual complete this five uh, page self report symptom inventory. And then we will respond to them, you know, and provide feedback regarding that symptom inventory and some handouts for tailored for that individual and where they're at with their symptoms. So that's something that we're hopefully going to have uh, up in the next um, I don't know, a couple months, I'm hoping, by the end of the summer. Um, some other uh, measurements that are out there, if you, know, you kind of do want to learn more about um, measurements and brain injury and how, particularly if you're working with any clients or anything. Um, and these are all things that if you do want more information on them, feel free to reach out to us and we can help answer for you. Um, there is something called COMBI, which is the Center for Outcome Measurement and Brain Injury. Um, it has just about every brain injury scale and assessment you could possibly want. <laughs> um, but these are some of the ones that are actually really um, relevant. Um, one is an awareness questionnaire, um, which really does look at the individual's awareness. We'll kind of talk more about that uh, in two weeks. Um, the MOS attention rating scale and then the overt behavioral scale. So those are some scales that are available that can be used. All of these are kind of readily able to be used um, by providers. They're free um, out there. So, but if you do want more information on them, feel free to contact us. Um, <coughs> these slides will be online um, after this, so you will be able to get those. Um, and then we also did do uh, uh, webinar Wednesday on brain injury screening. So if you are interested as well in like screening as a provider, um, that is archived on the website as well that you can watch and it has different screening tools reviewed. Um, one of the thing, you know, just as a reminder, as we talked about all these cognitive skills, um, really wanting to identify specific problems that are potential barriers to treatment success. Um, developing clear strategies to accommodate those problems, um, you know, taking into account the unique person's situation and learning style, 
uh, providing direct feedback um, as soon as you can regarding inappropriate behavior, um, being understanding that non-compliant behavior or lack of follow through may be a symptom rather than a sign of like non-compliance or resistance. Um, and then being patient. Um, you know, for individuals with brain injury, being patient with yourself, um, being patient with others and their understanding of brain injury. And as a provider, being patient and an understanding that individuals with brain injury often need extra time. They often need that patience, that repetition really to achieve goals and assistance in working on those pieces. So that is all we have. I don't know, anybody have any questions? May I go use the chat box so you can raise your hand or just start talking? That was excellent. You're welcome, DJ. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad it was helpful. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I'm glad that it was helpful. Um, yeah, it's uh, some information that we, you know, pulled together and wanted to get out there. I think sometimes we talk about cognition, um, but there's not always that breakdown into the different skill sets that make up cognition. So we wanted to provide that. Um, so, and as I said, it will be archived on the website. So if there's somebody that missed it, let them know um, if you want. And then if you want CEUs, there will be the link on the website for you to request CEUs. Um, and then in two weeks, we will be doing the um, uh, metacognition one. So feel free to join us for that one. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day.